welcome Professor Pat L uh, to the Near East by Midwest podcast with the NISA department here at The Ohio State University. We're delighted to have you here. Um, Professor Nama Patel is a faculty member at the University of Texas, Austin, um, and she's one of the leading uh, authoritative figures in historical linguistics of the Semitic languages in the United States. Um, in fact, she's delivering the keynote uh, address for the North Atlantic Conference for Afro-Asiatic Linguistics, uh, which we are very excited to be hosting this year. Um, so thank you, Professor Patel, for, for taking the time to talk to us today and tell us a little bit more about your research. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Um, so I want to begin by asking you to briefly tell us what is historical linguistics um, and why is the Semitic language family important, or rather should be important, to a historical linguist? So uh, historical linguistics is the study of change in languages, um, and it can have any other, any number of other implications, for example. Reconstruction can be part of it, doesn't have to be phylogenetic, the subgrouping of uh, languages, the relation, the historical relationship between them, and so on and so forth. But Essentially, it's the study of change in language. Um, now, the way we, we study change, because we can't really see it typically, um, is that we, we have um, accumulated uh, knowledge on, my, on changes in other languages, what's possible, what's likely to happen. Um, and that really depends on what is available to us, right? What kind of information is available to us? Um, so initially in historical linguistics, uh, Indo-European languages were what everybody studied. Now it's, it has changed, it's very much changed, and there's a lot more uh, information about many, many different languages, but still the Semitic languages are not really part of this conversation. And there's a lot in the Semitic languages that is very unique to that group that is not completely familiar to other linguists. And I think knowing what's going on in Semitic languages can really enrich the entire field of linguistics and historical linguist linguistics in particular. And so I think it's necessary to uh, introduce more knowledge, more, more studies on these languages. Absolutely. Thank you for your response. And to follow up on that, why is it important? I mean, linguistics is... Uh, an important field of study in and of itself. But more broadly, how is understanding the evolution and classification of languages and language families important, even indispensable, um, for answering broader historical questions? Um, well, it's linguistic history is part of history. So we don't know, a lot of times we don't know what happened historically. For example, especially in the Middle East with a lot of nomadic groups, we don't actually know because they didn't leave a lot of archeological evidence that we can use to reconstruct their history. But we know languages and we know their languages and um, a lot of them left li linguistic signs, right? There's um, uh, marking on walls, uh, inscriptions, all kinds of things um, that can help us trace the history of these people. Um, so you're probably aware of the of uh, North Arabian and and Arabic and those kinds of things. But even for example, if you study Akkadian, um, and all of a sudden you see Akkadian words in in, in so not Akkadian Aramaic, Aramaic words in Akkadian text, or you know where you don't expect them, and you know that there must have been semi Aramaic speakers in that area, and you can you can date it um, through that. So these kinds of things, it's just a small thing, but it, I think studying history without linguistics is not studying the entire um, history. And vice versa, I think historical linguists need to know a lot more history than what we typically do. That's fascinating. And I'm sure that plays a big part in your own personal research. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, the trajectory your research has taken over the years? Um, um, and have you always known that this is what you wanted to do? Uh, and if not, how did you come to discover uh, this passion? Uh, yeah, I always wanted to be a linguist. I just didn't know that I want to be a linguist of Semitic languages. That happened in college when I 
took a, an RMA class just because it, the only thing that's set in my schedule and I decided that that's what I want to do. Uh, I studied in Germanic linguistics. Um, my my dissertation was on Aramaic, historical syntax of Aramaic, and I that was in the first years of my position at UT. I did primarily Northwest Semitic languages, Aramaic, uh, Hebrew, uh, Canaanite in general. Um, and since then, I've moved to more um, Assyrian Akkadian, Akkadian in general, and Arabic. Um, so the 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 core of my work is in historical syntax. I look at how syntax changes, and for that you need languages with a lot of texts um, and kind of rich um, attestation, which is difficult to do on Canaanite languages, but it's very easy and fascinating on Akkadian Arabic. Um, so that's where I'm at now. I'm uh, one of my big projects is to do historical syntax of of Assyrian of the Assyrian dialect of Akkadian. And I'm hoping to be able to contribute a little bit more to Arabic dialectology, where I think the study of syntax is really lacking. And when you look at dialects, a lot of a lot of times people only look at the phonology and sometimes on morphology and completely neglect the syntax, which is really, really fascinating. And I, I hope that at some point I'll be able to contribute to that as well. Absolutely. Does that, um, will that be a factor of your keynote this Saturday? Uh, um, so my my keynote is is a broad look at Semitic, and I want to make a point that will be relevant for historical linguistics more more generally. Um, I think there's a lot in 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 Semitic linguistics that people who deal with these languages know inherently, but they they don't engage with other linguists, so it never occurs to them. It's actually really special. So I want to show, I want to make an argument about one of those issues. I think. Okay, well, we'll have to wait, wait yeah. to hear. Um, so you wrote a really influential article um, called The Decline and Fall of Semitic Linguistics. What can we do to stop it? Can you reflect a little bit on that and perhaps provide some advice for students who you know, they want to pursue the comparative study of Semitic linguistics in the U.S., mm -hmm. um, taking into account, you know, the present challenges in the field. Well, uh, <laughs> I wrote it in a very depressing time of Semitic linguistics, and things have not improved, unfortunately. Um, so I've, I've, have, I've had conversation with young scholars since then who have read the paper, and I think at, at least I was very encouraged to see that a lot of young scholars understand the need to come to these languages from a more um, linguistically oriented position and maybe to even study them in a linguistics department and insist on studying them in that context. And there are some up and coming scholars that I think can make a real change in the way Semitic is studied. Um, and, and we'll see. I, I just don't think that a lot of things change. I mean, right now, things are a mess for everybody. But specifically for, for us, I feel um, the, has a, the, 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 the kind of the core study of languages, even in fields that are philological or more historical, is really declining. Mm -hmm. So one, one way I think we can really salvage it is to, to teach it within a sub-branch that is really strong. So Assyriology is one of them, and Arabic is another. And I think um, Ahmed Anjela, your, your teacher, is doing a great job at this, and I think that's really the way to do it. So Arabic is strong. We have relatively a lot of students in Arabic, and training these students to be comparativists, to study more language, just to think about Arabic in the context of the whole, the whole uh, language family, I think that's the way to really strengthen the field and bring it back from the precipity. Precipity. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And what what would you attribute its decline to in particular? And when speaking to your students who uh, perhaps might not even know what it is to begin with, as I'm sure, you know, as teaching undergraduate students you've experienced, how do you introduce it 
um, as something that's not only relevant for reflecting on history, but also uh, revealing why we're at where we're at today. Yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, my path to Semitic linguistics, I started in linguistics, mm -hmm. but most people in the field come from theology or history and they just study the language to do something else. And then they realize actually it's really important, really interesting. I can ask different questions that I'm more interested in. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that a lot of these fields have put less and less emphasis on studying the language. So for example, if you look at Arabists at the beginning of the 20th century, they were all multilingual, right? They all, they knew the classical languages, almost all of them knew Hebrew, they knew Arabic, of course, and they knew a lot of other languages and they can really then work with that. Mm -hmm. um, but today, almost all the Arabists only know Arabic. Mm -hmm. And the same with Assyriology. There are very few Assyriologists that know something more than Akkadian and Sumerian. That's all they know. And they, in fact, there is this disdain towards people who think that they should also know Hebrew or some other language, right? They're not real Assyriologists. As real Assyriologists only know Akkadian. They only work with Akkadian sources. Mm -hmm. and that's that was one of the reasons, at least in the US, where they stopped caring about studying these languages for themselves. Um, in Europe, it's a different issue there. I think um, the, the way universities are organized there really uh, contributed to the decline. Um, they're, they really separate the Semitic languages in different departments. There's theology, there's uh, you know, Oriental Institute, there is Islamic studies there. It's, it's if they're not related to each other, as if we can't, we all are really the same region. Um, so that, that was what, what really brought about eventually the, the decline of the field. And now, you know, there's, um, the rise of all these theories. So people study the the Bible or Islamic sources from a, a particular p perspective, from a particular theory, from gender theory or from whatever. And it just, you don't need to know language very well. You need to know it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you can hear, and I have heard a historian saying, yeah, I mean, I need to know Arabic to read Arabic sources, but I don't have to know, I don't need to know Arabic really well, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's absurd to me. It's absurd. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's, you already, then is not you're not a specialist if, mm -hmm. if that's the direction you take. Yeah, absolutely. And to follow up on that, a lot of, I mean, what makes historical linguistics really fascinating, at least to me, is it gives you access to sources that are just so cool. Mm -hmm. um, because historical linguistics takes you into ancient mythology, yeah. and liturgical yeah. texts. Um, how would you say how do you balance between the technical side of historical linguistics and I guess you could say the more um, subjective side of dealing with texts and understanding what they meant, not just um, linguistically, but to a community? Yeah. Well, this this is a weakness for me because I don't, um, I'm not a religious person and I, I admit sometimes I don't understand. Um, right. I read a lot of Syriac and there's a lot of Christology or very convoluted Christian uh, theology, and I don't fully understand that. But for example, for me to read that with, with students, with graduate students, is really illuminating because they can explain what, what is meant by, by this. And I can, you know, I, I, I know the language very well, but I don't always understand the, the background. And it is a weakness. I think people need to do, to do that, need, need to know that. It's it's really, really crucial. I mean, how do we understand the language if we don't know what these people are thinking, what, what they care about? Mm, absolutely. And you mentioned at some point the importance of scholars talking to each other because oftentimes they, uh, you know, they collect independent data, but it's never consolidated to uh, establish patterns in the data. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little more to that and why conferences like the one you're here for this weekend are so important um, in your field and yeah. in general? Yeah. So, I mean, this this goes to what you asked me, the, the question you just asked me about knowing the, these texts and the, the content of these texts. I mean, we all have 
uh, lacuna in what we know and working with other people, not just, I mean, not just sitting in a conference and listening to them, but for example, working on a, on a project together, on a paper together is one of the, I think, the joys of the field because you learn so much mm -hmm. from just bouncing ideas and like absorbing the knowledge that the, the other person has. I love collaborating with people. It's, it really, I think, makes me grow as a scholar. Um, I love conferences as well because you, you meet people that you, you don't know, whereas some of that sometimes they're very young scholars that do very interesting things that I didn't know they are being done. And sometimes are people that I have heard of, I read, I, I never met. And there are people that we have a lot in common. We, we can really share knowledge. These are, these things are really indispensable. And I'm very happy that we have these, all these opportunities, um, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I know uh, this conference, I believe, was paused for COVID for some time. I think this is its first time yeah. uh, happening since then. So we're definitely very excited. We're excited to have scholars like yourself um, here to enrich our understanding and, and foster uh, these environments of exchange. Um, so thank you again for taking the time to uh, visit Ohio, visit the Ohio State University, and uh, tell us more about historical linguistics and your fantastic research. It's been a delight. Thank you very much.